What's up everyone? Welcome to the episode of Spitting Venom, aka the Venom Blog, and we are outside Golden Apple Comics. And as you can see behind me, all the Venom artwork and posters are strewn about, hung up, and looking awesome. So we're going to go in, pick up our copy of Venom First Host number 3, and then we're going to review it. So let's get to it. All right, we're back at my place and we are gonna talk about Venom first, host number three, and I think I forgot to give away the digital code. So boom, there you go. First person to put that digital code in, go to that website, put the code in, you will get a copy of the book. And I do have a second code that we'll give out in our next episode. In the next episode, we're gonna talk about the track listing from the score by Ludwig for the movie. And I will say it has some minor spoilers as far as story structure goes. It looks like the tracks are in order of you know the sequences of the movie. And so you kind of get an idea of the pacing of the movie movie and events that happen in the movie based off the titles from the track listing. So if you don't want any spoilers, I will give you a heads up now that the next video might have some in it and I'll do another spoiler warning or potential spoiler warning in the beginning of that video. But we'll, you know, before we get into the spoilers, I'll make sure I give away that second code. So if you tune into the first minute or so of the next episode, you can get a chance to win another copy of Venom First Host. Uh, and then also going to Golden Apple today was pretty awesome because seeing all those posters lined up was really great. It was almost like my own, you know, black carpet premiere walking up to the store and the guy had just finished uh, hanging the last of them. So it was really cool. My timing was really great. I did that intro a week ago. Now, you know, Venom First Host number four had just come out along with Venom number six. So I filmed that a week ago and I meant to do the review last week and I just didn't have time with my schedule and everything. So we're back here and we're doing it now. Um, and, uh, but it was just cool. And it also made me, uh, reminded me that I didn't talk about the IMAX poster. A lot of you guys asked me about it and I did post it on Instagram, but for some of you who follow me on Twitter, might not have seen it. And some of you on Instagram might've missed it. So uh, here's the image right there. That's the IMAX poster, and I love this thing. This thing looks awesome, and I definitely got to see the movie. Actually, I think I am seeing the movie on IMAX opening night. Uh, I think I am. So I'm excited for that. I think it, I can't remember because there's like an IMAX and there's like something else, like Dolby Atmos or something like that. I picked one of them. So I, maybe I didn't get IMAX. I don't know. We'll find out when I go uh, to the movies that night, or I'll check the tickets at some point. But either way, that poster is cool, and hopefully uh, I can get one of those for my room at some point. Uh, some of these posters that I've seen, uh, I definitely want to try to track down online and buy them and maybe like do like a whole wall of them at some point uh, we'll see i don't know uh wishful thinking and of course i don't have the money to really do all that right now and buy like 20 dollars posters so for now i'll just you know be happy with what i got i got some great artwork back there from gray matter art uh so make sure you check them out i'll put a link to them down below as well they have a lot of great prints and, and awesome artwork including venom stuff and other marvel and dc characters as well as some famous movies uh to check out so make sure you go check them out all right, so now let's get into Venom First Host number three. I'm gonna try to keep this brief uh, because I feel like sometimes with these uh, videos, these discussion videos, I just go through and just say what happens in the book. And I find that's the problem with a lot of reviews out there. And something, and one of the reasons why I don't like to review too much is because you know I feel like people just say, oh, this happened in the movie, and this happened in the movie, and then this happened. And it's like, yeah, that's not really a review. That's just you doing a, a scene by scene breakdown of what happens in the movie or what happens in the comic. So I'm, I'm, I try my best not to do that. And I try my best to interject my thoughts after a scene of like, okay, this happened in the book, but here's why I like it, here's why I don't like it. And I know a lot of us are gonna disagree on stuff. A lot of you, a couple of you at least wrote me and said that you felt the quality of this book is going down with each issue. I personally disagree. I like the second issue as much as I like the first issue, uh, but this issue I will say was my least favorite. And I can honestly say that now because I just finished reading issue four and I thought that one was a little bit better, kind of going back up in the right direction. So this one I would say is my least favorite of the books, but I still liked it and I still like that uh, Eddie Brock is driving the story. I like this character Milans here. This is Milans, uh, and she is uh, you know pretty tough character. I don't know why this is happening. They have him kissing on the cover. They don't really kiss in the book, so I don't know why they felt like putting that on the cover. Uh, it doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, but again, you know, I have the variants too. So the variants are kind of fun because you get like different artists working on stuff and doing different like images of Venom. Um, but in this book, you know, we have uh, Eddie at the end of the last book, he ended with, uh, you know, him with the, the offspring. And he's like, don't worry, child, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. So more or less in this book, what happens is that he you know, works with the child. The child is like speaking to him telepathically and says, hey, we should bond. You know, we should go after Venom. We should go save Venom, our parent. And he's like, you know, I, I want to, but I can't bond with you because, you know, like I'm not a great person. I'm trying to be, but I don't know if I am. 
and your me and your you know parent me and venom agreed that you know you shouldn't be corrupted in any way and i think i'm too morally gray for you to you know bond with i would rather you be attached to someone who is more heroic who who fights for a cause who maybe is a leading leading type and maybe someone who just is more altruistic than we are um or at least more leaning towards the good uh than we are and uh, and the suit's like yeah but you know i understand you made that deal but we need to save you know venom because venom is now in the hands of tel car and every time Venom tries to like lash out or you know uh, remove itself from Telcar, Telcar you know t like oh, basically does that thing where he looks into its programming or its DNA and he you know shoves it back inside of himself. So he's able to completely control the symbiote. And I think the way he's able to do that is because, and this is my theory, but whoever those beings were in the suits, uh, the engineers, I guess in a way, because um, it kind of reminded me of engineers from Prometheus, but not like in the Donny Cates kind of way where it's over explaining stuff, where it just kind of like th that's how their look is. They look like tall and menacing in a way. Um, but you have these guys who like you know picked up the symbiote and gave it to Tel Car. And it looks like maybe he learned some things about the symbiote. He learned how to suppress memories from it, which is interesting because whenever it bonds with a new host, it transfers memories from its previous host or previous lifetime, as we've seen in Dark Origin and other Venom stories. Uh, when Spider-Man got rid of the suit and it bonded with Eddie, Eddie instantly knew it was Peter Parker uh, because it inherited all of his memories from you know the suit. So this thing with memories is very key to the you know the the work of a symbiote. And the fact that it can be suppressed and kind of blocked off uh, by a being like Telcar is interesting. It, it, it shows something new uh, and something sc a little scary to the symbiote, the fact that it can't have access to all of its own memories. And so on that level, I thought that was pretty neat. And so Telcar is fighting back and he's like, look, you're not going to get control of me. I know how to suppress you. So don't even try. And he gets aboard a, a, a scroll ship and he's like, all right, we're going to take the ship and we're going to go out into space. And the suit's like, no, we don't want to go to space. And he's like, well, we're going there and we're going to find this weapon that I you know, knew about when I was undercover for the scrolls. And we're going to go find this weapon and we're going to use it and we're going to kill the scrolls and we're going to save my race from endless war. And I kind of like that because it does show that Telcar has a motivation. He has a reason for doing the things he does. Even though it's monstrous, he was threatening the child offspring, Venom's offspring life. He was uh, threatening Venom itself. He threatened Eddie Brock. He threw Liz Allen out the window, mostly as a distraction. He knew she was going to get saved. Uh, he's not here to really ruin humanity. He just wants the Kree Scroll Wars to stop. You know, this is an endless thing. Every time you think there's going to be peace, these two races continue to fight against each other. Um, and it reminds me in DC comics, like Rand Thanagar, like those two kind of groups uh, always fighting and stuff. So it's like, all right, these are like that version. It's like, you know, Kree and Skrulls, they're always going to fight each other. And he wants it to end. And he and he thinks also if he wipes out the Skrulls, he's like, hey, Eddie, like, and you know, I'm, he's talking to the suit too. He's like, hey, you guys, imagine if scrolls stop coming here you won't have any more secret invasions or anything like that like let me go wipe them out and uh and so there you can kind of see his motivation you may not agree with his tactics or his methods to you know accomplish those goals that's certainly what puts him in the villain category but the fact that you understand why he's doing stuff makes him at least a decent villain i think some people were trying to compare him to lee price and stuff and lee price i didn't understand his motivation for anything that was my problem with the character was i didn't understand why he wanted to do stuff other than he got a power like a new power like a symbiote and he's like all right i can use this to do whatever i want now and it's like okay that's your only motivation so that's why he never really worked for me and why i didn't like when he returned and then a mink i was kind of like eh who cares he wants to build a mob of venom characters uh, that seems really weak um it's certainly different than some other symbiotes we've seen in the past but it still felt very weak to me uh so i never really liked him but tell car i feel like there's a reason for what he does and he's on a mission and whether you agree with his mission or not it's still there it's still his mission and he's working on it uh so when he leaves he leaves with the suit to go do this and he disguises himself as milan's to get in uh, in the scroll base and uh, and take them all down he starts wiping them out and then meanwhile back on earth Eddie is still talking to the, the offspring. He's talking to Milans. They're trying to figure out a, a way of attack and try to figure out a goal and how to get there. And Dr. Steve chimes in. He's able to help them track the ship that left orbit and uh, and find their way to where Telcar is. So she says, all right, you know, Milans is like, I have a ship here. You know, it's, it's, right, it's nearby. And Eddie now bonded with the child. And he actually, when he bonds with it, you know, he says, all right, fine. I give in. Like, you, you know, you and I can bond. Uh, they form this thing. And I know a lot of people, and a couple of you at least, wrote me and said that you didn't like this design. You thought it was a, a Ben 10. I think Eddie Eddie's mullet maybe said it was like a Ben 10 kind of design. I can't comment on that. I don't know too much about Ben 10. I'll take your word for it, though. Um, but what I like about it from a symbiote design standpoint 
is that it is different. It doesn't have a symbol. It looks very movie-ish as far as like, you know, like the, it doesn't have all of the veins everywhere, but it just kind of has like a messy design on it. And that kind of reminds me a little bit of the movie. It also has green gloves, which I thought was interesting at the same time. Uh, it is a child, so maybe all this stuff is like extra ooze that's still forming you know, on some degree. I don't know. Um, but uh, we do know that most symbiotes do have two colors at least, or at least the Venom does and Carnage does. He has black and red and Venom does. I think Toxin might have had two colors too. Um, and so, yeah, so they're not just like one solid colors. Although I think the Life Foundation ones were, but to be fair, those were kind of engineered in a way, pulled out of Eddie Brock and the Venom symbiote, but engineered in a way in Tweet too. So it makes sense that they look a little bit different. Uh, but this one I liked because it's not like a big mouth either. It has like these breathing apparatus things, but, and then two eyes, but there's no big mouth. Although we will see a mouth at some point, I think in this issue or the next one. Um, but I don't know. I kind of like this a little bit. I don't love it. It's not like my favorite design ever of anything. Uh, still Venom is the best looking symbiote to me, but Carnage is a very close second. But this still looks kind of cool. I mean, I don't know. I, I'm not totally against it. Uh, but here then you have uh, Eddie now that he's in the suit. He can see that uh, there's a ship over there. And they do talk about how the, the offspring can talk telepathically. And Eddie's like, well, I didn't know you could do that. And again, that's not a new power for symbiotes, but not every symbiote really has that. So him being shocked by this, the fact that the child can do it is is okay for me. Like as far as a continuity, uh, you know, nut that I've become uh, after rereading all these stories. I'm like, okay, I can, all right, he's shocked that the child can do it. Makes sense. But then the child can also see invisible things as well. And the child can also become invisible. And that's the other big thing that it can do. Uh, and so meanwhile, while they're doing that and they're gearing up, they're getting on the ship and they're going to go out into space and take down Telcar. Telcar is wiping out all of these scrolls, as you can see here on this page. And then over here we have, uh, you know, Venom, or not Venom, but whatever the offspring is called. Uh, you have him and Milan's heading to uh, to space. And he even mentions another power he has, which is pheromones. He's able to release pheromones into the air to make people more agreeable with it. And that's how he was able to get Milan's to agree to him coming along. Because she was like, yeah, wait, why are you here? Like, they're in the spaceship on their way. And he's like, wait, she's like, how did, I, how did you talk me into coming here? And he's like, yeah, just a slight pheromone mist that uh, when I made an argument of why I should go, it just made you buy into the argument. And that, that was pretty much it, which is pretty, you know, <laughs> it's a pretty intense power it can definitely be used for very bad things. So, it, you know, it was good that Eddie was just like, look, I just wanted to come and help out. That's what I'm here for. And then that's when we get our first look at the teeth. So it looks like it does happen in this issue. Uh, and then they're heading to space and they're like, all right, we got to get there before Talcar finds what he's looking for. But unfortunately, he already did. And the book ends with him uh, emerging uh, over all the dead bodies of the scrolls. And he has the bioweapon that he was looking for that will wipe out the scroll race. So that was Venom First Host number three. I'd love to hear what you guys think. For me, I feel like this issue was the weakest of the three, but that's because I really did like the first two. And this one just felt like a lot of exposition and a lot of back and forth of where it was like, all right, we should do this, but we got to do this. We got to do that. It's like, well, just get to it. You know, sometimes I like things that are just fast paced that just move and move and move. And this felt like, all right, we're pumping the brakes a little bit. And I almost feel like if I was editing this, I don't know how issue five ends. I did read four today and I felt like that was a little bit of a tighter book but there's some things in four I would cut out and some things in three would I would cut out and maybe have made this a four issue miniseries and just try to make it keep going you know keep you know keep um, moving the story along uh, but there was some nice moments in the slow parts in this book that I did kind of enjoy and it was neat to see Venom or Eddie I guess in the new baby the offspring you know working their way to a, a symbiotic relationship and Eddie having good reasons why he didn't want to bond with it and then the suit giving him alternatives and saying well this is why you should and maybe even the suit using pheromones to get Eddie to agree we don't know that for sure yet either but clearly the suit wanted to go save its parent and it knew Eddie wanted that too so they had a common goal and they have a common enemy in Telcar and that's why Milan's decided that you know she would come along too and fight and Milan again she was going to go on her own anyway but uh, Eddie kind of you know like talked himself into going with those pheromones so uh, it's interesting but again I felt like this was the weaker one out of all three of them but I still liked it overall I do dig this story there's certain things and stories I look for and one of them is you know does it matter that it's Eddie Brock when I'm reading a Venom story whoever Venom is if it's Matt Gargan if it's Flash Thompson if it's Eddie Brock, it, it's like, well, does it matter? Like, does the story need them to tell this story? And for, in my opinion, yes, Venom First Host needs Eddie Brock to tell this story. And for that reason alone is why I really dig it and then why I'm um, I'm kind of elevating it over the other Venom book we have right now in Donny Cates' run, which I like that run. I like the concept of it, but I feel like some of the execution isn't there and I don't feel like Eddie Brock 
really matters to that story. It feels very much like a symbiote story and very little like an Eddie Brock story. Uh, but that may change because I think this is just the setup in Donny Kate's run. And then starting with issue seven, they are going to tell an Eddie Brock story. So again, I'm going to give it some time before I fully judge it, um, you know, based on uh, everything that's out now. But I will, in my issue six review, we will talk about that in our discussion video where I explain the things in issue six that I didn't like either and where I hope they took take the story so that way I can kind of go back and start liking it again. Uh, because right now I feel like that book, I'm kind of getting distant from that book and I'm not really excited every time a new issue comes out. I'm intrigued. I want to see where Donny Cates takes a story, but then every issue I pick up, I feel like I'm a little let down. This one's having a little bit of the opposite effect on me. I look forward to these issues. I wasn't looking forward to this run as much until I read the first issue and now I'm looking forward to each issue. And I really want to see how Mike Costa wraps up this run and wraps up his run in general because this obviously is all these events happen before the Donny Cates run because Donny Cates when his book started, it was three months after the ending of Don, uh, Mike Costa's Nativity run. And now this, you know, these five issues take place in those months uh, before Donny Kate. So it'll be really interesting to see. I hope the symbiote child, I hope nothing happens to it because it, uh, I'm assuming something might because, uh, you know, obviously it's not in the Donny Kate stuff. So I'm wondering if it's going to like merge with Milan's and go back into space and it chooses her to be its host. Um, I'm thinking that might be the, what's going to happen. Um, I hope it doesn't die, but you know, you never know. Uh, you know, I, I, again, I, w I don't mind one less symbiote around anyway, even if it's one we just met. Uh, we have too many symbiotes as is. So to me, I'm like, ah, you added one, but if you took it away, I wouldn't be so mad. But if it bonded with like Milan's and went out into space and it kind of disappeared that way, and maybe she became a space knight with it or something, they can go tell whatever stories they want out there. And that wouldn't affect Donny Cates' book um, at all. And then maybe down the road, like a year from now, Donny Cates could revisit that when he does his big crossover and you can have Milan's come back with the child and be involved in the big crossover. I don't know. Just speculating and just throwing a bunch of ideas out there. Uh, but I want to know what you guys think. Have you read Venom First Host? I know a couple of you are not digging it. So if that is true, let me know down below what you aren't liking. We can talk down there. And for those of you who are liking it, let me know what you are liking. And we'll continue the conversation in the comments as well. Thanks so much for watching my show. As always, like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff. And I'll see you in the future. Peace.